Hello everyone, welcome to this MedTwins video. Today we're going to be talking about gallstones. Keep in mind this is only an overview, so we're going to be talking about how gallstones happen and some of their complications. So yeah, let's begin. So gallstones are actually called cholelithiasis. So just to, just to break down the word, chole has to do with bile or gall, in this case gallbladder, and lithiasis has to do with stone. Um, I found this meme that I thought was really funny. Um, here's a reference where I got it from, uh, because it, it makes the, the gallbladder seem a bit useless. Um, but yeah, it, the gallbladder has a few functions. So it's to mostly store bile, but also concentrate bile. So yeah, I just thought this meme was funny. So in this video, uh, just a brief overview, we're gonna talk about what exactly is bile. So what is bile, what are its functions, what is it made up of. Then we're going to talk about the causes and the epidemiology of gallstones. Then the pathogenesis, so how do these gallstones happen. The signs and symptoms, so how would someone with gallstones present. Uh, the pathology itself, so what exactly is going wrong. How do we make the diagnosis of gallstones. Then some of the complications that may happen if someone has gallstones, which there are several of them, we're going to touch on a few. And also the treatment. So how would you treat someone that has gallstones? So let's continue. So a quick overview of bile. So bile is produced by the liver and it is one of the ways in which your body can excrete cholesterol. And most of the bile is actually start in the gallbladder. The bile has a few important components that we'll talk about in the next slide. And the main function of bile is to emulsify fats to aid in the digestion of these fats. So yeah, emulsifying means basically almost like separating the, this fat into some big clumps, then colipase and lipase can act on it a bit easier. So let's talk a bit about the causes and epidemiology of gallstones. So bile is actually made up of a few different components, including cholesterol, as we mentioned, but also the bile salts, phospholipids, among others. And these things need to be in a fine balance in order for gallstones not to precipitate. So factors that can increase your risk of having gallstones is anything that can upset this balance in bile. So if you have increased cholesterol, this can help in the formation of fats. And as we're gonna talk in a second, most fats are actually cholesterol stones. Also decreased bile salts, which can happen for a variety of reasons, can also help form gall, uh, gallbladder stones, but also gallbladder stasis. If your bile is not really being excreted as much, if it's just kind of staying there in the gallbladder, this can help the crystallization of several components in bile and then forming these gallstones. Gallstones are relatively common. Approximately 10 to 15% of people have gallstones. I saw this online. And um, most uh, females are increased risk, so females are more likely to have these gallstones. But most of these gallstones are asymptomatic, mostly they just sit in the gallbladder and they don't really cause them any problems. As we're going to see, most gallstones usually become symptomatic when they uh, cause an obstruction of some sort. So when they're just laying there, they're not that much of a problem. Usually, they're not that much of a problem. And they're two main types of gallstones. One of them is the cholesterol stone, which is by far the most common, which is about 80% of gallstones. And there are several risk factors that can increase your risk to having these, including Crohn's disease. Again, Crohn is a disease that impa uh, Crohn's disease impacts your terminal ileum, which is where bile salts are usually reabsorbed. Uh, so again, this will upset the balance of your bile composition. Also, above age 40, age is definitely a big uh, risk factor. So if you're above age 40, uh, you, you're increased risk of gallstones. Also, if you're taking hormone therapy, so this could be females um, after, the, uh, after menopause, or it could be transgender individuals, but also people who are taking anabolic steroids um, because maybe, uh, maybe even illegally because of gym and everything like that. Females that have had multiple children in the past, people who lost weight very rapidly, or obese people. Again, if usually when people are obese, they can have increased cholesterol. So this would again 
uh, imposes a risk factor for the formation of cholesterol gallstones. The other main form of gallstones are pigment stones. And again, Crohn's disease impacts on this for the same reason. Age above 40 as well. And by far the, the main risk factor here would be chronic hemolysis. If you have um, any form of hemolysis, so uh, sickle cell disease or spherocytosis of any, or any other form of uh, hemolytic disease, you're gonna increase the level of bilirubin in your blood and this plays a major role in the formation of these pigment stones. Also, alcoholic, alcoholic cirrhosis can increase the risk, biliary tree infection, and also total parenteral nutrition. This is not very politically correct, but it's a good way of remembering the main risk factors for cholesterol stones and for pigment stones as well, mostly cholesterol stones. And it's the four Fs. So if they're female, if they're overweight, here's written as fat, but if they're overweight, if they're fertile in the sense that they had multiple children in the past, and if they're above 40. So just put this image just for you to visualize what kind of person we're talking about. All right, now um, a bit about how these stones actually come to happen. So when it comes to cholesterol stones, there are three main factors um, promoting these stones and promoting them to happen. So the first one, as we mentioned, is cholesterol supersaturation of bile. So if you have a lot of cholesterol in your bile, it's gonna help make these stones possible. So, but it's not only the content of cholesterol, but it's also its content relative to the amount of bile salts and phospholipids. The phospholipids in the bile salts can help make the bile a bit, can help make the cholesterol a bit more soluble in bile. So if you have a lot of cholesterol relative to bile salts and phospholipids, you're more likely to have these stones. Another factor could be crystallization promoting factors within bile. So there's some evidence that the composition of bile itself can help make these cholesterol stones possible, inclu including like deoxycholic acid, which can help promote the formation of stones. As we mentioned before, the mobility of, sorry, the motility of the gallbladder can help make these stones. So if bile just kind of stays there in your gallbladder, without being excreted as much. It can help make these stones possible. It can help them crystallize. Now, another type of stones, stone that we already mentioned is, are the pigment stones. So the main risk factor that you'd be looking for, especially in the exam question, would be any form of hemolytic anemia. So I gave you a few examples here, like spherocytosis, sickle cell, uh, micro, macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia, but also microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, uh, any of those other, other genetic disorders like um, G6PD deficiency or pyruvate kinase deficiency, among others. Just watch out for those in exam questions. But um, also disorders that will affect bile reabsorption. Most of these will affect the terminal ileum, like Crohn's disease, among others, or if they had a resection where they had to remove part of their ileum, keep Keep, uh, keep that in mind when you're reading through a question or when you're talking to a patient. Also, there's some evidence that some bacterial infections that affect the bio tree can promote the formation of these pigment stones. So bacteria that produce glucuronidase and phospholipase can contribute to the formation of these stones. And there's a third type of stone that we haven't really talked much about, which are, which, which are the brown stones. These are mostly caused because of infection I highlighted a few organisms here, but mostly watch out for E. coli because that's going to be the most common biliary tree infection. So here's an image. It's I didn't take this photo. The link is right here, which shows a few different types of stones. So this is the pure cholesterol stone. Uh, keep in mind that most of them you can't really see in uh, in an X-ray. Most of them are actually radiolucent. About 10 to 20 percent of cholesterol stones are radiopaque. So yeah, watch out for that. Here's a big gallstone, which usually when they're very, very big, they can have a complication called gallstone ileus. That's something we're gonna talk about later in this video. Uh, here you can see a black pigment stone. So that's what they look at look like. This is the rarer ones. That's about 20% of gallstone cases. And there's also here the brown pigment stones that are mostly caused by infections. Now we're getting to one of the most important parts of the video, so please pay attention. So let's talk about the signs and symptoms of someone that has 
gallbladder stones. So most of these are actually asymptomatic, but they can have symptoms if the gallstones are put, I put an image of Stonehenge because it's just one of the most fam famous pieces of stones or rocks, I don't know, boulders, yeah. Uh, so it, most of them are just sitting down here, so they don't really ha cause them any problems. But once they actually move near the cystic duct and actually obstruct the movement of bile, that's when symptoms start to appear. Many times they can come to cystic duct, get a bit lodged, but then move back into the gallbladder, uh, which would cause what we call biliary colic. So it's a colicky type pain, and it's caused by the gallbladder trying to push these gallstones. So most of the patients I spoke to described an episodic epigastric pain, but from most of the textbooks I read, it can also be a right upper quadrant pain. So when it's, when, when, whenever I heard episodic, I used to think maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. But in reality, these can last for actually very long periods of time. So they can last up to six hours, maybe. And um, lots of time in the history, you, ha you have heard of them describing this pain before, like they have felt something like this before. So it's usually an episodic right upper quadrant epigastric pain. And this pain, if there's irritation of the phrenic nerve, it can radiate to the right shoulder and right subscapular region. This is very important for your exams. They can definitely mention these signs and you should watch out for them. It can also be followed by nausea and vomiting as well, which is something you wouldn't want to miss. Now, once a stone is actually pushed through this section, it can actually become compacted here. It can actually get stuck in the cystic duct. And that's when we have what's called cholecystitis. I wrote the translation of what cholecystitis means. Just keep, in, just keep in mind, cyst in this case does not really mean cystic duct. This is just what helps me rem uh, remember what exactly is going on in this condition. But call call again has to do with gallbladder or just gall or bile. Cyst, not really, but it has to do with cystic duct, but not really has more to do with the gallbladder itself. And inflammation has to do obviously with the gallbladder becoming inflamed. So itis means inflammation. So th this just helps me remember that it's when 95% of cases is when a stone gets blocks the cystic duct. So the cystic duct is this yellow segment here. I didn't make this, uh, this picture, but I think it's very useful. So the cystic duct is right here, and it's when there's a stone stuck right here. And this is going to cause the gallbladder to become very inflamed, and its walls are going to become very, very thick. And the gallbladder is going to be pushing against this obstruction, and that can lead to distension of the gallbladder. Again, this, the walls are going to become very thick and there could be some deposition of some fibrous tissue. And because of this distension, there can be an effect to the vascular supply to the gallbladder. If this vascular supply is significant, you can have what's called acute gangrenous cholecystitis, which is definitely something you don't want to have or something you don't want to see as a doctor. I mentioned 95% of cases are because of a stone getting stuck in the cystic duct. The other 5% of cases are what's called acalculus cholecystitis, so there's not really a stone. And it's usually caused by extreme gallbladder stasis, maybe gallbladder hypo hypoperfusion, but also cytolo cytomegalovirus infection. Um, so keep in mind, keep those things in mind for your exams. Uh, a potential complication that you can have because of the effect to the vascular supply and the inflammation is secondary infections. So yeah, you definitely don't want that to happen to your patient. And a sign that you can see is called Murphy sign. So we, if you ask the patient to breathe in and you start palpating where the in the right upper quadrant where the gallbladder should be, the patient's going to be in a lot of pain. And so when you touch that region, they're going to stop breathing in because of the very sharp pain that they're feeling in their right upper quadrant region. And this inspiratory arrest is called Murphy sign. Uh, I put a link here to a video of someone demonstrating the sign. I didn't make this video, but I think it's very useful. And a few symptoms that the patient present with are very similar to the biliary colic. So right upper quadrant pain, 
sometimes m most of the time actually epigastric pain but a lot of the times as well right upper quadrant pain this pain if it affects the diaphragm if it affects the phrenic nerve it can uh, radiate to the right shoulder it can cause also nausea and vomiting again this person is going to be in a lot of pain but uh, a, a good dif a good way to differentiate them is this patient is going to have a lot of fever and if you do a blood exam they're going to have very high white blood cells so these are two things to watch out for in the patient and it could help point you towards cholecystitis but again looking seeing fever and high white blood cells alone is not diagnostic for cholecystitis if the stone is not removed and it continues to be pushed down the biliary tree it can then become lodged in the common bile duct and this is called choledo uh, do cholithiasis so just to break this word down again col as we know has to do with gall bile or gallbladder dog has to do with duct and lithiasis has to do with stone so it basically means a stone stuck in the common bile duct and because it's stuck in the common bile duct and it's impeding the flow of bile it's going to affect the liver so you can uh if you do a blood exam you can notice changes in the liver function tests including an increased alkaline phosphatase and always when you see an increased alkaline phosphatase also check ggt because alkaline phosphatase alone can be increased in some bone conditions and some other conditions as well so check ggt as well there's going to be an increase in conjugated bilirubin and also ast and alt these are usually the first ones that would go up in this case as i was told by one of my doctors and once it gets stuck here, the patient is going to have several of the symptoms we already talked about. So biliary colic, which is the epigastric or right upper quadrant pain with nausea, vomiting, and also fever. But in this scenario, they're going to have altered liver function tests. And also they can also have jaundice as well. So once you see patients that have these symptoms, there are several ways to make the diagnosis of gallbladder stones. So the diagnosis is usually made by clinical history and it can have several different imaging modalities, which can include an ultrasound examination. Uh, this is very, very useful when it comes to, to gallstones. There's also cholecystography, which is not really used as much anymore, but it still can be very much used. Endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. I haven't heard of this being used as first line usually i've heard more of ultrasound being used as first line and then the ercp done usually later um, and the ercp is not only diagnostic but it's also therapeutic so it can help actually remove the stone or literally fish out the stone and magnetic uh, reson uh, resonance cholangiopancreatography this i've i've heard about it being used as uh, first line imaging and it's it's very useful to see the stones. I'll show you an image of all of them. But uh, I think the most important for us to know here is the ultrasound and also the MRCP, which are two very important imagings when it comes to cholecystitis or not only cholecystitis, but any form of gallstone. Keep in mind, gallstones, they're mostly, uh, cholesterol stones are mostly radiolucent and only about 10 to 20 percent of them can have some element of calcification in which you could see in an x-ray so uh, definitely think of these imaging modalities instead of a standard x-ray and pigment stones you can usually see them uh, they're radio opaque so uh, i'll now show you a few images of these different procedures so this is an ultrasound to make the diagnosis of gallstones you can see a stone here and this is the gall bladder and you can see the wall is very thick so this can happen for several reasons and we mentioned that cholecystitis is one of the reasons so the gall bladder has become very its walls have become very inflamed and thick uh, this is cholecystography i don't really know how to interpret it that well but i see an arrow being pointed here where i would think the abnormality is this is a very good image of an ERCP. Again, I didn't take any of these photos. I found them online, but you can see the device coming up here, injecting some contrast so that you can see the biliary tree going up here. This is the gall, uh, gallbladder, and here it starts to become more of the liver. 
So very good image showing your RCP, which again, is not only diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic. You can actually remove the gallbladder stones using this procedure. Um, another one would be the MRCP, so magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. Here you can see the gallbladder and you can see some stones here at the bottom, or at least what I would think is our stones. Yeah. So once you're able to diagnose someone with gallbladder stones, there are several different options of treatment, and I divided the treatment into three different sections. So supportive, this would mostly be pain management, giving fluids if they need fluids. There's a very high risk of infection, um, especially if there's stasis, inflammation, and problems with the vascular supply to the gallbladder. So consider antibiotics as well. Of course, analyze each in situation individually, but consider antibiotics. There can be a drug treatment for it, but it's not really used, which is ursodeoxycholic acid, which can help dissolve the stone, but it's not really used. Um, the surgical options are a lot more effective, and this usually is going to take several, it's going to take a long period of time taking this medication. So yeah, surgical treatment is usually the, the option, which would be called a cystectomy, the removal of the gallbladder. ERCP, which helps fish out the, the gallstones. Shockwave lithotripsy, so it's where shockwaves are used from outside the body to help break the stone and then remove the little pieces of it. Or stent can be used in the case of a stricture. So if the person has a stricture, uh, they can bypass, the, they can use a stent to go, to be able to continue the flow of bile. Uh, by far the two that I've heard being used the most are the ERCP and the cholecystectomy. Uh, yeah, this is from speaking to doctors and anecdotal evidence, so yeah. Um, now there are several complications that can happen if someone has a gallstone. One of them is a gallstone ileus, we're going to talk a bit about that. That's when there's a very large stone and it can actually obstruct um, your intestine. Usually this happens in the, um, the terminal ileum in the ileocecal valve. We will take a look at that. There can be a porcelain gallbladder. This is usually caused by chronic cholecystitis. There can be ascending cholangitis, which is inf uh, an infection of the biliary tree. And there can also be acute pancreatitis, which can happen because of the stone and because of the RCP as well, which is one of the treatments for the gallbladder stones. So yeah, we're gonna talk about that now. So a gallstone ileus is when there is, it's when there's inflammation of the bladder, because of, sorry, of the gallbladder because of a large stone. And because of this inflammation, there forms a fistula between the, the, the bowels and between the intestines and the gallbladder. And this, this is because of inflammation and they start to touch each other and eventually a fistula forms. And this fistula can then pass one of these very large stones. And this large stone can then obstruct the small intestine. So the usually in the ileocecal valve. It can happen in other places, but this is by far the most common place. And there is a few ways that you can, that a few signs that you can pick up to suggest um, a gallstone ileus. So there's usually air in the biliary tree called pneumobilia. Again, there's a fistula between the biliary tree, sorry, between the gallbladder and the, and the intestines called the colis cystoenteric fistula. And so because there's air in the intestines and there's a fistula, there will be air in the gallbladder. So you can see what's called the regular triad, which is the pneumobilia, as we just described, there's air in the biliary in the biliary system there is a small bowel obstruction again you have a huge stone that's obstructing your intestines and also you're going to have a gallstone in the iliac fossa usually these stones are huge they are massive you can see pictures here they are massive stones so the way that you treat it is with nasogastric suction suctioning again you have a huge obstruction you don't want to give more things in and create even more pressure. So you remove contents. So you remove fluids and air. Rehydration as needed. Sometimes these people can appear very unwell. 
So be careful with giving things by mouth. Usually this would be IV fluids and things of the sort. And obviously emergency surgery. I don't know how else you're supposed to remove something that big. So emergency surgery would be needed. Um, another complication of chronic cholecystitis is what's called the porcelain gallbladder. So chronic cholecystitis, from my understanding, is when a stone can maybe enter the cystic duct and then it can leave or it can go and maybe pass through and not really cause them any problems. But over a long period of time, as we mentioned, the gallbladder becomes very thick. It can become very, it can, there can be the position of some fibrous tissue. And in the chronic, in the long term, there can be some calcifications as well, which is where the term porcelain gallbladder comes from. And this can damage the gallbladder and form these calcifications in the edge that we can see. And eventually it can even alter the histology of the gallbladder. So this is what a normal histological image of the gallbladder looks like. And it can eventually develop what's called these rikitansky ashkov sinuses, as you can see here, which aren't normally supposed to be in the gallbladder. So this is a sign of chronic inflammation of the gallbladder. And if someone has a person in gallbladder, this increases their risk of gallbladder cancer, which is a form of adenocarcinoma. It's an extremely rare form of cancer. But if someone has this person in gall gallbladder, it becomes a lot more common. That's why patients with this condition usually have a prophylactic removal of their gallbladder. So before they develop this form of cancer, they already remove their gallbladder just to avoid it. Another complication is ascending cholangitis. So this is because the, the flow of bile is very, is, is very important to avoid the infection of the biliary tree. So if there's an obstruction that impedes the flow of bile, it becomes a lot easier for the bacteria from the uh, intestines, or the duodenum in this case, to infect the biliary tree and ascend, so ascending cholangitis. So usually the bacteria that will would that would infect the biliary tree would be E. coli, maybe Klebsiella, maybe different Enterococcus species, so all of these gram-negative organisms. And in this infection, in ascending cholangitis, you can see what's called Charcot's triad, which is jaundice with fever, right upper quadrant pain. Uh, and you can also see altered uh, liver function tests, like uh, elevated alkaline phosphatase, elevated GGT, and among others. And if this infection usually starts, starts to progress towards sepsis, you can see what's called Reynolds pentad, which is essentially Charcot's triad, together with altered mental status and shock. So this is indicating towards a more septic picture. So less complication we're gonna talk about is acute pancreatitis. Uh, so this can happen, the most common causes of acute pancreatitis are actually alcohol-induced um, acute pancreatitis and gallstones, which can obstruct the flow of the pancreatic enzymes as well, depending where this stone lodges in inside the whole biliary system. So usually in acute pancreatitis, you're going to see a very high increase in lipase and amylase. Lipase is more specific, but most hospitals will use amylase just because it's a lot easier to well get the results and mostly from a cost perspective. So usually amylase will be elevated three times than the upper limit of normal. So it's going to be very, very high. And several, in Acute pancreatitis itself can have several very bad complications, such as the formation of cysts, necrosis, which is something you definitely want to watch out for, a hemorrhage, an infection, and obviously organ failure, so pancreatic insufficiency. So uh, also the treatment for gallstones, um, ERCP, can also cause acute pancreatitis. So I got a few images here that I got online. Again, I didn't make these images, but you can see a very swollen and inflamed pancreas, which would make you think of acute pancreatitis. So just a quick summary now. So gallstones, gallstones have very characteristic symptoms, and these symptoms can vary, as we saw, depending on where the stone is lodged. The diagnosis usually requires your clinical assessment and also imaging. Keep in mind ultrasound and also the MRCP. 
treatment is usually surgery, but in some rare cases, you can use drugs or maybe some other forms of treatment. And obviously supportive treatment as well. These people are going to be in a lot of pain. They could be, they could need fluids as well. So watch out for that. And there can be several very severe complications such as infections, there could be obstruction, there can be gallbladder damage and pancreatitis. So watch out for these complications because they can be very severe if they're left untreated. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Leave a like if you found this useful. Let me know what I can change. And yeah, I really appreciate you watching and thank you.